Today is July 29th, 2022. I'm Cameron Wood here with Robert Toth. Uh, we're at the A Place for Us Apartments in Cleveland, Ohio, and we're going to talk about the gay community in Cleveland. Mr. Toth, can you please say and spell your name for me? Uh, Robert Toth. Uh, T-O-T-H, first name Robert, R-O-B-E-R-T. And you go by Rob. Uh, Rob or Robert. Where and when were you born? Was born in Cleveland, Ohio in 1958. I am so last century. <laughs> uh, what what uh, neighborhood in Cleveland did you grow up in? Uh, grew up in Collinwood area. Uh, Collinwood High School, five points was a real big uh, neighborhood, um, and it still is, um, in Cleveland, Cleveland proper, yeah. Um, what did your parents do for a living? My father worked, I gotta remember this, worked for Gould Incorporated as a boiler technician, and my mother was a stay-at-home mom. Um, I'm one of six kids, so my mother had her hands full. When did you realize you were gay or come out or? Yeah, uh, that's a. It's always an ambiguous question. Yeah. Well, that's a story unto itself. Yeah. Um, growing up, I was always called queer, sissy, whatever. Um, big time bullied. Like my hat would be taken off, thrown in the gutter, thrown in the sewer. I lost a lot of hats that way. Um, my books were spat in in school um by the bully and um i mentioned to my mother like oh they're they're calling me name blah 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 blah, blah. and um well, that's because you're just different everyone's different and you know i was a screaming queer from like second grade on honey i was hands all over the place and flying all around um yes i was different um, there was a word for it, but my parents, like a lot of parents, um, my new parent, how do you, how do you tell your, your child they are something that's going to be ostracized within their own community and the community at large wants you dead? And here we are in 2022, um, with the new SCOTUS ruling, yay, not yay. Um, so I grew up just being how I am. Um, I mean, I wore moccasins all through high school. I wore hip huggers. I wore four inch platform and I wish I would have kept these, um, four inch platform shoes. I was six foot four. So I was six foot eight platform shoes in high school. People would ask me, Hey, can you see someone, blah, blah, whoever down the hall? And I would just look, Nope, she's not coming. Oh, good. So I was kind of like a, a scout. Because I was so I was six foot eight on with platform shoes. Um, it turns out I was a scout for my locker partner or neighbor in high school who was dealing drugs out of his locker. My back was turned, and all he said was, "If you see whoever the principal or whatever was, let me know." I didn't know I was a lookout for a drug dealing, um, and back then. It wasn't marijuana, it was Speed and Black Beauties. Um, I think they're the same thing. Yeah, Black Beauties and Speed are the same thing. Oh, and, um, oh, what's that? That downer drug, I forget what it's called, Quaaludes. Um, I don't know, I don't know how kids made it through high school. Some didn't, um, some had to go back. So, Living in Columbus, 1978-79, um, my roommate and friends of his, we were, we were, they were going to go out one night. And they said, now, Robert, we're going to take you someplace. You may not, you may not like where we're going to take you. And if you don't, that's okay. But we think you're going to like this. Uh, it was the gay bar, the Kismet, which I think is still around in Columbus. A Kismet 2 now, I think. <laughs> it was right next to Leather Stallion. No. Right next to... Trade Winds? Like a leather bar right next door. 
Um, you were just a child. You were still in your, you were still in diapers. Um, so they take me to this, to the kismet. I go in and there is someone who I have had sexual relations with startled. I run out of the bar, sit in front and uh, Lou came out and said, are you okay? You okay? I'm like, yeah, but there's someone, I forget what I said. He, I'll remember him laughing, what kind of chuckling, like, yeah, it's a gay bar. And that's when it kind of dawned on me that there is a thing that I can be and it's called gay. And there's more than just me. And this is like a universal thing for a lot of people I know that when you come to that realization that you're not the only one, it is a mind blowing experience. Um, so much so I went to the first, I think it was the first gay rights march on Washington DC in 1979. And there were, I was on the top of the ellipse looking down and there were all these gay men and lesbians and biker chicks and biker guys and school teacher looking people and whatever. We're all just people. And I was like, my God, there's like thousands of us. Um, so in 1979, I came out to myself and my family. Um, and of course, you know, the parents, the usual, oh, it's just a face. How do you really know? And well, I knew. Um, parents didn't want to hear anything about it. I mean, they weren't, they didn't disown me like they do for, have done and still do for a lot of their kids, um, which I guess I should be thankful for. And I am in their own way. They were okay with me, um, but they never asked me if I was happy or who I'm, who, if I'm dating anyone. Um, since they knew it would be a guy, they didn't want to like maybe affirm my choice um like anyone would choose to be part of a subgroup that's ostracized worldwide that was condemned worldwide that was murdered and we're still having murders cleveland has a lot of transgender murders very sad um you wouldn't choose that say oh i want to be that i want to be hated and spat upon and murdered i want to be that group yeah um, ever since like first grade, everyone liked Marianne Melly. I liked Joseph and I won't say his last name, um, cause he's still alive. I just thought, well, you like who you like. And I didn't know it was wrong for a boy to like a boy. Um, and Joseph had no idea I liked him. I didn't know that I liked him that, that way. Um, so from 1979 on, I was pretty militant. Go fags, um, embrace the fag. Um, it was really our group. It turns out my roommate was gay. All of our best friends were gay. Our, my neighbor was gay. Everyone was gay. Everyone around me was gay. And I had no clue that they were or I was. I guess it depends on your focus and how self-aware you are. I wasn't very self-aware. I'm still working on that, work in progress. Um, and I'm 63 years old. Um, so that was pretty wild. Um, and I guess that set the stage for my later AIDS activism and HIV activism and um, volunteering within the health and services arena um, regarding HIV and AIDS. Um, I, I zero converted in 1988. Um, it was an extremely dramatic zero conversion event. Um, some people just get a cold, if anything. Um, and zero conversion is when your body recognizes there's a virus that shouldn't be there and your body fights against it. Um, that's why some people want to get a cold. Some people don't get have any symptoms. I got all of the symptoms. Um, I was working at a pizza place, came home. It was a real hot summer. 1988 was a very hot summer. 
um, like 100 degrees hot, which is extremely unusual. Um, I remember going in, coming home, putting my key in the door, and just falling into the foyer, like literally, uh, fever 104, projectile vomiting, like the exorcist, um, drenching night sweats. And this is, some people, a lot of people, when they hear about the symptoms of serial conversion, oh yeah, my, my sheets were kind of moist when I am in my night sweats. I'm like, no, 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 no. Drenching night sweats are just that. When you can wring the sheets out and you're dripping water, the sheets were changed more than half a dozen times. Um, I was sh shaking. I, my body was in shock. Um, oh, I remember vomiting just, just everywhere. I couldn't, I had everyone stay back, stay back. Um, I was living with my sister in her one bedroom condo with two kids, my niece and nephew, and my mother was visiting at the time. So it was like a full house and there I am, projectile vomiting, drenching night sweats, shivering, going into shock. Um, I knew what was happening. I'm like, this is so, I've had strep throat before. When I was young, other kids would get like a, a cold. I would get strep throat, fever 104, um, couldn't talk, um, ice compresses on my head and the back of my neck. Um, Actually, the, the the queer is more dramatic. What can I say? Um, I don't just get sick. I get like really sick. Um, so my serial conversion event, 1988, that was like sep August, September of 88. Um, the next morning we went into this little town to get a strep throat culture because I'm like, I, it's a strep throat. Um, and the doctor came back negative. The doctor asked me if I had have had an HIV test. I said, well, no. So you you don't know if you're HIV positive or not? I'm like, mm, no, I have no reason. Um, I had had um, protected sex, uh, safe sex. Condoms are good. And now with monkeypox, you kind of want to be physically separated because you don't want monkeypox on your Johnson. It's disgusting. I haven't seen it, but it would be really gross to see those postules on your penis. I mean, ugh. Um, so now we're coming, kind of coming full circle with HIV and monkeypox again. Um, at least the fear of monkeypox, maybe. But uh, I digress. Um, came home to Columbus. Got Went to the, the public health department across the river downtown. And, you know, they want a name. I'm like, George Bush. My, you're like the umpteenth George Bush we've had today. I'm like, well, you know, George Bush has AIDS. Um, George Herbert Walker Bush. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I was given, I was going to school to finish my degree before I turned 30. I took a break because um, I discovered I was gay. I discovered gay sex, which I liked. Go figure. Um, alcohol, because I could drink. I was, I was nine, I was eighteen. I was seventeen when I got into college. I only went to college, um, so I couldn't go out drinking beer with everybody else. So I just kind of got left by the wayside. Um, so I didn't bother with alcohol or beer. Ugh, I can't drink it. Why bother? Um, so then I, I discovered beer, drugs, and alcohol. Drugs, meaning marijuana. Um, and my, I was failing. I'm like, so let me just take a break. So I came back up to Cleveland, worked, went back to Columbus to finish before I'm 30. Excuse me. Worked full time at Lazarus Department Store in downtown Columbus in the visual display department. And um, I got my diploma a week before... my birthday and tested HIV positive shortly thereafter. So I tested, 
I actually had then CDC defined AIDS, which was T cells 200, 200 or below. Um, that definition shifted a couple years later to you have to have T cells of 200, 200 and below and one or two of these opportunistic infections. If you don't have an opportunistic infection, your T cells are just low, you weren't considered having AIDS. I'm like, well, that's kind of weird. But leave it to the government to make up their own definition. Because um, if, you, if you look in, in the records, there was a huge portion of people um, claiming HIV disability in the 80s. And that's because the definition fit. And I did have several opportunistic infections. Um, that's why my doctor said, you know, with what we know now, you probably should go home and make your final arrangements. Um, that was 1991. Um, and my doctor had a large HIV clientele. That's how I got kind of hooked up with him is um, friends of friends, go see this doctor. He knows what he's doing. Um, no one really did. They were flying by the seat of their pants as best they could. God bless them. And some still are. God bless them. Um, so that was like a huge, like, what the hell? Um, I know who infected me. Um, I harbor no ill will to the person because it takes two. I, I was a buddy volunteer and I saw like, this is what unprotected sex sharing needles does or can do. Um, I don't know, or no, I don't know, nor did I care how my buddy, um, I was a volunteer for the Columbus AIDS task force, buddy volunteer program giving respite to individuals in the hospital. Um, at least my buddies were um, hospital at the time. And um, nobody knew um, really kind of how to do things. Um, we were all kind of figuring it out. Um, so, I mean, so I knew how not to get, not how not to expose myself. Um, it was really bad sex and really forgettable sex because I remember it and I wish I didn't. Um, but, you know, Dems to breaks, you know. So um, my last buddy was, he had a flower shop in Sherman Village that everybody loved and with good reason, he was really good. Um, but he was my last buddy. So I was a buddy volunteer for several years in Columbus. Um, and then at some point I just decided it was enough with, after I lost my fifth buddy. Yeah. Five. Um, people, my, uh, us buddies had our own support group that we could talk about the struggles that we're dealing with, if anything, or, you know, just to touch base to make sure we're okay. And after five of my buddies died, the uh, leadership of the volunteer program said, you might want to take a break. And I did. I, in fact, I stopped because I just started dealing with my stuff. Um, and that's when I ended up coming back to Cleveland, ostens ostensibly to die. Here I am, 2022, still here, still queer, still looking. Um, so uh, that's when I volunteered. Um, let's see, 1992. Oh, for the, the Ryan White Planning Council. Um, but I need to, I need to backtrack a little bit. When I was in Cleveland, because I've, I've gone from Cleveland to Columbus, Cleveland to Columbus to Cleveland. So I forget when I did what, where, when. They all kind of blend together. Um, I was a co-editor of High Gear magazine in, in Cleveland, Ohio. It was an offshoot or part of the um, LGBTQ Community Center or Services Center of Greater Cleveland. 
and high gear, G-E-A-R, it was all initialed, Gay Educational Awareness Resources. And it was information um, about um, gay events. Um, this is way pre-AIDS, pre-HIV um, for Ohio. And it was also disseminated into Detroit, Pittsburgh, Covington, and Covington, Kentucky. So there were four kind of states that border us. And maybe some went to Indianapolis too. I don't know. I don't remember. But our staff would deliver them to the other state, other cities like Akron, Youngstown, Columbus, Dayton, Cincinnati, Toledo, um, Detroit, and all that. So I was co-editor when they were on located on West 14th Street in Tremont. Um, for some reason, they either lost the space somehow or um, so the the offices for high gear were literally my living room. Um, we had the big, um, big adjustable table that I did the cut and paste. Literally, you cut it, you paste it with hot wax, and I had a bowl of ice cubes on a nap on a towel on a dish because when that hot hot wax hits your finger, you got to put it in that ice right away because it would burn like a son of a gun. And then you wait and then you peel it off really slow. Uh, nowadays, it's all computer and it's so nice. Um, you don't have to deal with a lot of people um, and or burning yourself or cutting yourself. And then I would take the finished piece down to a printer. They would photograph it. Several days later, I would go to the printing offices before my paying job and spot tone the negatives. I had a small monocle to look on a light board with a little number one fox hair brush and uh, spot out any debris or, so, or spots on the negative before it gets printed. Um, and I did that for, we did that until we folded. Um, into what is now, what was then, um, Gay People's Chronicle. And there's a new iteration of that. Thank you, Ken Schenk. Uh, the Flame, I suggest. It's free. You can look at it online. Um, so I did that for a couple of years. Um, like I said, the offices were in my apartment upstairs, and my co-editor and her partner lived downstairs. Um, Broken into three times. Um, I was in the Denison area of Cleveland. We were renting from a board member who had a house. So he he rented to us because he's a board member and we were part of ostensibly the um, the, the center because we were the editors of, co-editors of High Gear. Um, so did that for several years until it folded. Um, And the one stain on my that I take personal is that I remember clearly someone showing me that article about AIDS and it's coming. And what are you gonna, what about this? What about this? And <laughs> things were polarized then because my response was, that's just a Republican plot to put us down because now we're finally getting our rights. That's, that's crap. I just dis disregarded the warnings of HIV. And I, as a newspaper editor, um, should have put it front page, but my blinders were on. I wasn't, I didn't have a degree in journalism. I didn't have a degree in English. I was, had a degree in a Bachelor of Fine Arts, you know? Um, so I really wish I would have done more because um, maybe that would have helped our circulation, which would have helped it stay afloat, uh, but hindsight is always twenty twenty, um, and things are how they are. So you know, this, I just wish I would have done would pay more attention. Um, but uh, so then I fast forward. I was I became a, I was a volunteer with the Ryan White Title One Planning Council, 
we allocated and prioritized federal HIV AIDS dollars for a six county region in Northern Ohio. Um, we were, they were mandated to have HIV positive individuals, like they still are. Um, now it's a consortia, but they're mandated to have people who are HIV positive involved in the decision making, um, which is as it should be. Um, like the Denver principles that were written by people with HIV and AIDS, and there are allies and doctors dealing with HIV, um, it was the empowerment principle um, that every other disease is embraced. Um, just like the red ribbon. The red ribbon used to mean A's. Now we have red ribbon, pink ribbon, green, blue, a plethora of ribbons. Um, same with flags. You know, uh, oh, I can't think of the young the guy who invented the, who developed the gay flag. Um, so I was on the consortia, on the planning council. Um, and that was, that was interesting. Um, I'm glad I did it. That's back when we had county commissioners. And that, since it changed to a consortia, the whole dynamic has changed. Um, that's the natural flow of any organization. Um, so after that, um, as a private citizen, I was a private citizen, but as a, as a um, unaligned individual, um, I still spoke out about HIV and AIDS and um, inequities in dealing with the system, um, how AZT was not our friend. Um, AZT was a recycled cancer drug that back then, that's all they knew that we had. Um, it made a lot of people really sick, but we didn't know, they. no one knew any better. Um, we were all grasping at straws back then. I remember it was a blue and white pill that I did take a couple of those a couple times a day. And some people had to take them like every couple of hours. Um, people had beepers, they had pagers to take a pill, take a pill, because that was a life-saving uh, pill. And basically it was a placebo effect that was saving us. Because that pill was poisoning us. Um, and um, then I became involved with the Ohio AIDS Coalition, um, which was out of the out of Columbus, prior to moving to Cleveland, I should say. I'm sorry, I'm getting all this jumbled up. Um, after I be after I was a buddy volunteer in Columbus, after my fifth buddy, I I stopped volunteering. Um, I segued to volunteering with the Ohio AIDS Coalition, which was then um, part of the Columbus AIDS Task Force. And the Ohio AIDS Coalition um, presented Healing Weekend events, which were a, um, a three-day event held around uh, the state only for people with HIV. Um, so we met with people who were HIV positive. Um, we had, there were workshops um, dealing with health and wellness, Reiki, massotherapy, diet, um, side effects of drugs, and maybe how you can combat those side effects. Um, and then there were fun things like tarot card readings and horoscopes. You have to have, you have, to have some fun mask making, um, a lot of music, and um, we had a talent night, which was kind of fun. Um, some very talented people. Calvin Edwards, may you rest in peace. Um, very talented young man. Um, and as co-facilitator, we had to coordinate getting the workshop presenters, the rooms for people who are HIV positive. Um, we had to, uh, um, that's the word I'm trying to think of here. Uh, try to find vendors or individuals who would donate um, um, uh, soda pop snacks, things like that for people who needed to take their medications with food. Um, and then little gifty items to put in people's bags where we had a, we take a Polaroid picture and put your name on it. And it was on a wall and um, was stapled to a bag. 
and people were encouraged to leave to leave notes of encouragement to someone. Like when you talked about being a, being a, a mother of three living with HIV, that really hit home for me because I thought I was the only one. And you know, I, you're very strong, or just words of encouragement to people. Put them in the bags with a little gift item, gifty things, um, which I also had to find vendors willing to give us things. Um, for those who are worried about you know doing things like that, always ask. And if they say, I'm sorry, I can't help you, follow up question. Do you know someone who can? So no matter what you're looking for, always do the follow up question. Like, uh, no, I don't take section eight. Well, do you know anyone in the building who does? Um, if you're looking for housing. Um, so always ask that follow up question because you never know where it might lead. And it does take you places, which is, it's a, it's a must when you're doing things. It's a follow-up question. Do you know where I, if you can't, do you know someone who can? Um, and a lot of times they do. Um, so it never hurts to ask. So I did that for several years with um, Michael Abdenauer. May he rest in peace. Um, he was my co-facilitator. And we presented healing events in Oberlin twice. Um, Burr Oak, which is a uh, part of the state park system, which has just been um, renovated beautifully. Uh, but we did the healing weekends around like in uh, Lakeside, Ohio, Burr Oak. Um, I think we did one in Dayton. And I didn't do one in Cincinnati just because of logistics. I was just too far away. Um, I still don't have a car. Um, and those are really nice events because you could relax. You knew everybody around here was... HIV positive or an ally, like most of the, the workshop presenters were, uh, they were not HIV positive, but they were allies. They were people who want to help however they can. Um, and they were, they were, they were really held the weekends together. Um, and that was, that was very, um, very draining, but very rewarding when it was, it was all done. Um, because then you get ready for the next one. Um, so I did that. And that's when I'm, after that, I moved back to Cleveland and all that stuff. Um, so since then, I've, I've written articles. I should say I submitted articles that have been um, publicized in The Plain Dealer. Um, and Scene Magazine and Cle Cleveland Scene Magazine. Um, no national publications, but we'll see what happens with that. Because um, now there's COVID and monkeypox. Um, it's always something. Um, so I'm kind of still, I'm right now I'm looking for my next incarnation, whatever that may be. I don't know. I'm 63. Um, so we'll just see what happens. Um so do you have any questions or want to follow up on anything I said? Or? Yeah. Um, can you talk, you've written a lot about um, the drugs used to um, combat AIDS. And even though they're saving lives, they're also kind of eroding them as well at the same time. Could you talk a little bit about your own drug history, I guess, as, you know, as you've used them and experienced them and how they've effective they've been or not been? Oh yeah, sure. Um, well, like any long-term survivor, I've been HIV positive since 1988 or I've had AIDS since 1988. And back then the only drug that was available was ACT. Uh, Dr. Para, P-A-R-A out of the Ohio State University's clinical trials. And I think he's still there. Um, a friend, a friend through the Ohio AIDS Coalition, Michael McDonald, may he rest in peace. Uh, he was a nurse with the clinical trials. And he said, Robert, you know, back then, especially back then, you didn't want an HIV diagnosis on your insurance because they could drop you. They don't need a reason. They could just drop you. You have no insurance. So 
what I did, he said, you know what, you can get your blood tracked, at least, I don't want to say track, but um, quantified. Like we can tell you where your CD4 cells are at, where your CD8 cells, where your white blood cells are. This clinical trial will do all those labs for free and you don't have a name. You either you are uh, randomized either on a placebo or the medication, and sometimes it's double blind, where the where the what is it, where the, where the clinician doesn't know that you are or are not on the medication, and sometimes they do know, but you're randomized to a number, um, and that number that pill just comes out, they're all the same, and then at the end of the trial they would tell you if you were or were not on the medication. Um, I was on ACT, and for me, um, horrific diarrhea. Just awful. Um, and then I had also what I would call the, I was an AZT bitch. It, you would, you would just, your nerves would just be, you would just be on edge and be snappy and yelling at people. It was real nasty. Um, the side effect of the diarrhea, I remember leaving my groceries in the car to Big Bear. I had to, I was living just off of Neal Avenue, off of Goodale Park. That's the name of it. <sighs> Took me three months to remember that name of Goodale Park. But it came to me. Um, I was living near Goodale Park, and there's a Big Bear right on, off Neal Avenue. I remember leaving my groceries in the cart because my underwear was full of poop. I would come home, have to shower, change my clothes, and then I realized I can only get like three things to the grocery and come back because I then go to the bathroom. Three things to the grocery, come back, go to the bathroom. Um, I was losing weight like crazy because I was having diarrhea. Um, and at that point, I had several opportunistic infections. And that's when my doctor said, you might want to go home and get your papers in order. Um, so in 1991, I moved back to Cleveland to die. Uh, here I am. And um, I, I came back to Cleveland for two reasons. Uh, one, my family is in the area. Um, and number two, Cleveland Clinic. So I knew I'll be hooked up with the best healthcare in the country, even though Cleveland Clinic was just downgraded. But we won't say that. Um, so I knew I would be, I would get top of the line care, come back to Cleveland. So I was on ACT, went off that. Um, let's see, boy, I was on DDI, D4T, also known as Stavudin. Um Those were terrible because you, you couldn't take one while you were on the other. And if you did, you had, had to have two hours in between. So I had a, double, a dual alarm clock. I would just all the, there would be tablets of, it's either DDI or DDC, I forget which one. The tablets about the size, like size of a half dollar that you're supposed to chew and then swallow, like two of them, and they were nasty. So I'm like, well, as long as you swallow it with water, why don't I just dissolve them in water and they just take the water? Same thing. It's all getting into you at the same time. So I would, <laughs> I would drop the tablets in the water. My alarm would go off. Drop tablets in the water. Go to the bathroom. They'd be dissolved. Take the pills. Go back to bed. My second alarm would go off one or two hours later to take my other pills. So I would take those. Then an hour after that, I could eat something. So my morning was... Put two tablet, put the two tablets that are in like a small glass, juice glass, in water. Go to the bathroom. Take those pills. Go to sleep. Wake up. Take the other pills. Go take a shower. Get the newspaper. Feed the cat. By then it's an hour. Then you can eat something. So there's this whole routine that I did for three years. Um, and then... 
switching off medication because my, my T cells um, were at 11 at one point. They were at 11, like 11 T cells. Um, and I was on Stavudine, well not Stavudine, I was on, oh, there's, there's, I can't think of the name of it. Sostiva. Yeah, Sostiva. Um, a side effect of that was hallucinations, which I guess can be good, depending on what you're hallucinating. Uh, I was hallucinating that the drawer pulls on my dresser were spinning. And they weren't, but they were. In my, in my eye, they were spinning. I'm like, well, that's not fun. And other things were happening mentally. I'm like, this is not sustainable. I, I, can't, I can't live like this. This is like, ugh. So I talked to my doctor. And so, okay, we went off that. Uh, I was on the first formulation of Truvada. And then I was on Crix of, then, then the Vancouver conference. Right now we're having the AIDS 2022 in Montreal right now. It's the International AIDS Conference. It's right now happening in Montreal. Um, 1992, 94-ish, um, there was a Vancouver conference. That's when protease inhibitors came out. That, and I hate to use this phrase because it's so overused now, but that was a game changer, the protease inhibitors. Um, if only some people could have held out, only their bodies could have held out. Um, oh, because I lost several good people, good friends, just prior to that. Like, oh, if they just could have held out like a year. And I'm not, I'm not blaming them at all. But why couldn't this drug have come along sooner or been released sooner? Um, and I was put on Crixivan and Norvir. Norvir, Ritonavir, is a booster medication. I, I think it's still used, I'm sure it is, but it boosts the effect of, a, of their medication, HIV antiretroviral that you're currently taking, um, which was Crixivan. Well, I was losing all my hair, like my armpit hair, my head hair, my little bit of chest hair. Um, pubic hair, leg hair was all like going. And I know some people would pay for that. Some people do. Um, I am not one for that. I like my body hair. Um, and I remember telling my doctor, I'm like, well, if I'm on Crixivan and a side effect of Crixivan is hair loss and Norvir is a booster, wouldn't that necessarily boost the hair loss that I'm experiencing from the Crixivan? And I remember this whole conversation because there were several nursing students or uh, interns. My doctor said, would you mind if they came in? I'm like, nah, not a problem. Um, and I remember telling my doctor, I'm like, blah, blah, blah. You know, would Norvir boost the bad side effects of Crixivan also? And they all had their Blackberries at the time because this is before cell phones. They had a Blackberry. Can you imagine? Um, everyone having the same device. So they all got their Blackberries. They're like, oh yeah, he's right. So patients aren't stupid. Hello. Um, so went off the Crixivan, went off the Norvir, my body hair came back. Now, this is just genetic, nothing you can do about it. Um, so that taught me like, I ain't stupid. Do your research before taking any medication, which I always do anyways, and did with Crixivan. Um, just because it's new and everyone's like, ah, about it, doesn't mean it's right for me. Um, because some people like with ACT, if you weren't out about your HIV status and you had to discreetly take a pill that's beeping in your pocket and go to a bathroom, like in the middle of um, a concert, the symphony, a movie, a family, 
oh, I gotta go. I'll be right back. You know, you were still in the closet and there's a lot of fear behind that. Um, because like I said, you could lose your insurance. Um, so luckily with the Crixavan, the Norvir, those are like once a day kind of pills or twice a day maybe. Um, I've run the gamut through all the medications except all the classifications of medications, I should say, um, except with the new injectables. And now there's a subdermal um, HIV medication, lung acting. So it's all changed so much um, and for the better, obviously, because a lot of us are still here. Um, but a lot of us, and a lot of us precursors to COVID. Um, back when I was a buddy volunteer, we were told, oh, you got to mask up. I, uh, my buddies were either at um, Doctors North, which is right in the Ohio State area, and then another one that was just, I can't think of it. But we were told by the people, you, oh, you got to gown up. So we had to put a mask on, the goggles. This is, this is some serious stuff. Um, before seeing a mask, the yellow body paper suit, gloves, blue booties. I mean, you were going into a hazmat situation. I mean, you were, but you kind of weren't. Um, being a buddy volunteer back then, I knew how HIV was transmitted. It wasn't airborne. It wasn't by touch. So I knew I didn't have to wear gloves. I didn't have to wear the outfit. So I would, before going in to see my buddy, I would, before going to the room, I would just peek my head in and say, would you like me to wear a mask or not? It's up to you. I'm here for, to keep you safe. Um, and they're like, ah, I don't care. So I would just wear a mask. Um, I took all that stuff off before I went in the room. Big biohazard sign on the door. Um, this, what really got me is back then, they would leave food trays outside of people who were dying outside of their door on the floor in the hallway. By the time I got there, it was cold. I would bring it in and say, here's your, did anyone? So the part of my responsibility was to feed them. And I didn't mind. These are human beings dying. You're not feeding them because you're too afraid to go in the room. At least bring them the food while it's hot. Um, thank God things have changed, um, at, least with, at least with HIV. Um, so I've been through all that with my doctor. I've gone through several doctors with, at Cleveland Clinic. Um, and let's see. I, know, I remember noticing a, when I had 11 T cells, I noticed a small lesion on my back. I knew, I knew it was Kaposi sarcoma, which is a form of cancer um, normally seen in Mediterranean men, elderly Mediterranean men, that was, had become an opportunist, opportunistic infection for those living with, who were HIV positive. And that was a sign that this is some serious stuff people don't recover from this. It's the the character in Philadelphia that Tom Hanks portrayed had the lesions. Um, that's kind of what this would have led to. Um, I knew what it was, had to get a biopsy because that's the protocol. And sure enough, it came back, KS, Kaposi sarcoma. Um, <laughs> and I remember this because not 10 days later, I, I had or I had tickets to go to Cancun with my then boyfriend. Couldn't couldn't not go. Um, couldn't get a refund because it was too soon, and I wasn't like in the hospital hospital. Um, so I was there. I was going to Cancun, having just been re-diagnosed with AIDS because the diagnosis for AIDS shifted from 1988 to 1993, 94. Um, my 
because I remember when he I get the I got the biopsy results, my doctor said, "You have a complete sarcoma. Um, you have AIDS again." And I remember walking out like, oh, "Fuck!" That's all I'm like. The hits just keep coming. Yay! Not. Um, I got to get ready for Cancun. <laughs> was not in the mood to party. It was. I know I put my my boyfriend through hell being there. Um, we broke up shortly afterwards. Um, we were broken up twice prior, and you know when you break up with someone, just make it a clean break. Wish them well on their journey. If you still remain friends, that's great. If not, just no ill will. And I don't wish him any ill will. I never have. Um, but that was a sucky vacation. Um, so that was, it was interesting working with my doctor. And I've always, and I told my doctor that I'm, you know, I'm the partner in this. Just because you say that I need this medication doesn't mean I'm going to take that medication. Let me do my research, make sure it's the right fit for me, my lifestyle, my how I live my life, um, and I'll get back to you. So I was on Crixivan, Norvir. Oh my God, it's I was on all of them, and then like I say, this new classification of medications have come out in the last the last couple of years that are injectables or long lasting medications where you uh, come in once every six months. And I, I know other people you're interviewing can extrapolate on that. Um, so it became involved in clinical trials here in Cleveland because, again, I didn't have insurance um, and I needed to have my HIV monitored. Um, so I was a, a volunteer there, um, a study volunteer, I should say. And then somewhere along the way, I became involved with the living room. Now, the living room was an HIV AIDS drop-in center when the LGBT center was on West 29th Street. And what made that special is that it was a standalone, or it was, it was, it was right next door to the LGBT center. So people didn't have to go through the center and identify as being queer or um, or gay or lesbian to come into the living room. It was a, it had a, its own street entrance, um, and I staffed the front desk as many other individuals did. Um, we would keep a list of of, of uh, doctors, dentists, funeral homes um, that would accept someone who's HIV positive, and especially funeral homes. Um, funeral homes back then were hit and miss who would, who would take a AIDS infected corpse, um, for God's sake, the person dead, um, such was the fear back then. Um, and people would, we were a resource people could call, I need dental help. Do you have anyone who will work some, with someone who is HIV positive? Um, so we had a binder and we would give people the references, um, and I resurrected this series called House Calls, where we would um, have individuals from the greater Cleveland area or from Cleveland proper who were either healthcare professionals, um, dietitians, massotherapists, um, people from Social Security. Um, a lot of them were pharmaceutical reps, which would always bring food and that would get people to come to, to attend the... Um, the how that certain house calls, um, and that was that was fun um, because we would get information and we would get brochures and we would kind of um, disperse that throughout the throughout um, the center and the living room itself, um, and then we would have weekly, um, weekly or bi monthly, I forget, but we would have HIV AIDS we would have HIV support groups. Um, and those were just rambunctious and fun because we were all, we were all this together and, um, buddy volunteer buddies, you were allowed to bring your buddy to support group if you, if they wanted to come. Um, 
it was all confidential. What you saw there stayed there and all that. Um, and that was just a really fun time. Um, knowing, you know, other people, it was always nice to know that you're not alone again. Um, and then I became involved with the AIDS Task Force of Greater Cleveland and their AIDS walks. Um, way back in the olden days, we had AIDS walks in Cleveland. And that was, we were raising funds, um, similar to like the March of Dimes and all that. You would get, you would walk, you would get sponsors and they would give you money that would go to, I forget where I went to, but I think I went to the AIDS Task Force because they were the only game in town at the time that was dealing with, with HIV um, exclusively. Um, and they um, had, and still do have case management services, pantry services, um, kind of some housing services, but not really. Um, but they could connect you to housing services if you needed it and clinical trials and all that. Um, and now things have gotten, a lot of places have an HIV AIDS coordinator, like Circle Health here in Cleveland, University Hospitals, uh, Cleveland Clinic, Metro Health. Um, they all have their own HIV AIDS navigator or department um, that will connect people to services that aren't necessarily medical only. Um, so that was that was interesting, um, and then after that, my volunteer work was basically um, within the community itself, not necessarily HIV related. Um, I was um, got to get this in the right chronology. I was um, I can't remember now. I was PR chairperson for the North Coast Men's Chorus. Um, I always made sure that there were tickets for our concerts for people in the spectrum. Um, tickets were, you know, because it it's important for individuals to do something that's not HIV related. This was in the community. It was always a fun thing. Rich Cole was the, is the music director still. Um, he always presented fun, quality entertainment for the LGBTQ community. Um, and they're, they're still going to this day. And that was fun. Didn't know I could sing, but I could. Um, I, the last thing I did was I brought um, Bernadette Peterson um, to the Capitol in uh, Playoff Square. And after that, I kind of, you know, tried to find my fit within the, the community that was my fit that was not in the HIV community, but that was with the general community at large and um, volunteer for our local Hungarian museum and gift shop, um, kind of things like that. And now I'm kind of, I'm still, I, I will never stop speaking about HIV and AIDS because um, now, especially with COVID, um, you know, we knew how to mask up and glove up last century. Um, and now with monkeypox, um, we know what we know. Like we didn't know with HIV. We didn't know if it was airborne, if it was by touch, if it was by, you know, you couldn't share. Should we share utensils? Can we eat in the same room? Now we know it's not transmitted that way. We, we found that out pretty, kind of pretty early on. Um, and with monkeypox, we know specifically exactly how it was transmitted. Um, which, if you are of, of the MSM community, um, there is physical, actual physical skin-to-skin -skin contact involved. You kind of can't do that anymore. Um, or you shouldn't. I, If you are someone who has multiple sex partners, uh, where there is skin-to-skin -skin contact. So we know, get the vaccine if you can find it. Um, so now we're in another 
MSM designated epidemic and it's monkeypox. Um, and personally, I think that the government is failing yet again, failing the, el- failing the gay community um, that we, that at every STD clinic in the state, they should have monkeypox vaccines. Are you engaging in risky sexual behaviors? We see that you are. You are putting yourself at risk for monkeypox. We have the vaccine. Would you like to have a vaccine? As long as you're here being treated for syphilis, gonorrhea, chlamydia, HIV, which we know are all sexually transmitted diseases, monkeypox is not specifically sexually transmitted through semen, through um, semen or breast milk uh, or blood. It's touch. So skin on skin contact. So we know this. So why don't we get people who are a captive audience at an STD clinic, um, the monkeypox vaccine? It's one-stop shopping. We're not reinventing the wheel. Um, There won't be enough vaccine until 2023. Meanwhile, it's being seen in children. I mean, that kind of like, what the hell? Um, But it's been traced. They are doing back tracing, which um, they've shown that it's someone along the line they've come in contact with, uh, contact tracing, which they're not doing with COVID necessarily. Unless you're the vice president or the president, then they'll see who you've been in in close contact with. Um, But, you know, you wear a mask when needed. Get vaccinated, get boosted. No excuses. Um, Really. I mean, come on, folks. It's as if we all would have worn this when the previous president, who shall remain unnamed, if we all would have worn masks, if that individual, instead of saying, I didn't want to create a panic. Well, one thing I found is when disclosing your HIV status, um, to me, there is a timeline that you wait until you're comfortable and disclosing your your, your uh, sexual orientation. Um, you wait till you're comfortable with it because if you aren't uncomfortable with it and you disclose and you are upset, they will be upset. So you wait till you've got it. Okay, it's HIV. I I know my numbers. I'm comfortable with as comfortable as I can get. Um, so I'm going to disclose my family. Um, that you disclose um, when you are ready. Um, so with COVID, you know, we know, we know what you would have worn masks way back when. This would have been, this would have burst like a bubble, but that number 45 didn't want us to wear a mask because he didn't want to create a panic. Um, meantime, he got COVID, like the whole entire freaking White House staff got COVID. Um, our current president, got COVID. This could have been over, but we don't want to be muzzled. Um, Here we are. We're still wearing masks. At least I am. And I will wear a mask until it's completely over, 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 over. Like no new cases in America. Um, I wear a mask on the bus. I wear a mask when I go into a store. When I come home, I wash my hands. Especially now with monkeypox, we know it's skin and skin contact. When people hand you your change back, there's a little stuff going on, a little skin to skin contact. Um, and when and if I do have sexual relations with someone, they are completely monkeypox safe. Uh, now I have to qualify it monkeypox safe. Um, and it's still enjoyable. Um, so we have to be, re- we have to be, uh, uh, creative yet again um, because of monkeypox. But it's a small price to pay. I don't want monkeypox on my Johnson. Ugh. Just the thought of it gonna, ooh, gives me the heebie-jeebies. Um, so um, here I am, you know, um, diagnosed in 1988 when I was 29 years old. I'm now 63. 
no one knew we I would live to old age. Um, and now my um, my focus is not affordable housing because affordable housing definition and low income definition are totally different. Because now in Greater Cleveland, and I know it's around this is around the country, um, they're they're building. They're everyone's getting all civic minded. We're doing we're building affordable housing. Well, that's if you're working and have two incomes. I know people who are working, they can't afford, they're moving back home. Um, and I just saw on the news night before last that the homeless population of individuals 55 and over is over 9%. So there are people who are living in their car with their daughter and their grandchild and a, and a family pet. It was on the news night before last. I mean, we are in a housing crisis in this country. And CMHA, if you're listening, you got to educate landlords as to what Section 8 does and doesn't do. But you also might want to start some sort of program where the landlord doesn't have to wait two months for his first month's rent. I found this out. I'm still looking for an apartment in Lakewood. Um, that has a porch. That's all I want. A little outdoor space, um, balcony. I'll take it. Um, that takes section eight. The big. St I've asked landlords after I'm looking at a unit. Oh, by the way, would you take section eight for this unit? And when they say I used to, but don't anymore. My follow-up question is, well, you used to. Why don't you take it anymore? And they all said the same thing, that the process for getting your unit inspected to me getting my money is takes me two months. So they don't have two months to wait. Um, meanwhile, there's a lot of units that are that could be rented out to someone on Section 8. Um, but they, for, for that reason and probably others that I'm unaware, they've decided to, to, to not take Section 8 anymore. And our, our local housing authority doesn't do exit interviews. Like, oh, you used to take Section 8. You're not taking it anymore? Why? What barriers did we put in place that we can remove? They don't, they don't do that. Um, I mean, if it's a simple enough barrier, get it done. I mean, remove it. There are people that need housing um, and landlords that need rent. So if you can, it can be a win-win, um, but that's my big push now because housing is healthcare. We're finding this out. We found it out with HIV because you need a safe place to store your medication. Some medication needs to be refrigerated. Um, you can't do that at a homeless shelter. Um, some medication is, is liquid. How do you store it in a refrigerator? You can't do that at a shelter. So we're finding all these things out that we know now. Why, how, why is housing healthcare? Because it gives you personal access, access to your medications in a safe environment, which is your home, your house, your apartment, your condo, whatever it is. Um, and here we are, you know, housing as healthcare was the motto 15 years ago, and it still is now, especially with COVID. Um, that you need a space to not have to wear this. Um, so here we are coming full circle with another pandemic. Um, so I, any questions? I know I kind of bounce around a lot. Yeah, one, one thing. Um, I think that it's, how has the, this pandemic felt compared to the AIDS pandemic? I mean, they're def very different diseases, no comparison, but emotionally, have they been very, has it been a similar feeling? Yes and no. Um, AIDS, during, during the AIDS pandemic, I mentioned briefly about the Kaposi sarcoma lesions, Tom Hanks character in Philadelphia. Um, many times, AIDS had... AIDS presented with physical outward symptoms, 
like the skin lesions of Kabozi sarcoma, um, where you could see someone and you could tell that they had Kabozi sarcoma. And since they're not like a 80 year old person with a Mediterranean background, they had AIDS. So there was an outward manifestation of that. With COVID, you don't know because HIV was not airborne. HIV was, we know, blood, breast milk, other, other ways, and semen. Those three bodily fluids have HIV in them if you're HIV positive. And that's how it's, that's what they say is, you know, safe sex, condoms, condoms, condoms. Um, women who are pregnant taking HIV medications while they're pregnant, it will, it will help the, their infant clear HIV out. So there were known ways of clearing HIV and preventing HIV. And now the, huh, now the government, the federal government has come out with undetectable equals uninfect, untransmittable. U equals U. Bruce Richmond literally just yesterday spoke at the Montreal um, International AIDS Conference that undetectable equals untransmittable that if you can get your HIV virus viral load down to undetectable levels, it means you cannot transmit HIV, even if you had unprotected sex. This is not an excuse to have unprotected sex. This is between partners that they know they can't, like especially zero, zero discordant partners, someone who's HIV positive and someone who's HIV negative, that you can't transmit it to your husband, wife, or your spouse, or other sexual partners. So we know that. With COVID, COVID's airborne. It could very well be somewhere in this room somewhere. It could very well be on the bus somewhere. You don't know where it is. That's why you wear a mask. Um, the Early on with HIV, there was the fear because it was... It was Haitians. <laughs> However, that came about, I don't know. It was, oh, if you're Haitian, or if you're like Haitian from Miami, or if you've been to Miami, because that's where a lot of Haitians were, um, you could have got an HIV back then. Well, no. Um, it's sexually transmitted, sexually, or with um, sharing needles. Uh, we know that, or dr or blood infusions. We know a lot of individuals, like Ryan White, um, contracted HIV through a blood transfusion. It was a, a young, twelve, young kid. So we know we know all this with HIV. COVID was a new thing. I'm going to say it. Trump knew and did nothing. He knew. He was told by his chief of staff in, in December of 2020, that there's this airborne virus coming from, well, China, that it's airborne and it's contagious and it's deadly. Trump was told these three things and he did nothing. He didn't tell you to wear a mask. He didn't, he didn't, he didn't, okay, he didn't ask you to wear a mask. He didn't ask you to wash your hands. He did he knew. I mean, he knew. He knew. And I, to, over a million Americans have died of COVID. Over a million. Democrat and Republican. Diseases don't care, like we know with HIV. Diseases don't care what your political affiliation is. It's a disease. Um, or what your sexual orientation is with HIV. It's a disease. COVID doesn't care about anything. It goes where it goes. Um, and with the advances made in HIV research, they were able to develop a vaccine for COVID, which is a retrovirus, which means it changes, it mutates. And now we know there's the BA something something uh, COVID variant that was President Biden contracted that because that's highly contagious. Um, so we know with COVID how to prevent it. We didn't know with HIV necessarily. It took us a while to figure that out. 
if you're HIV positive, if you if you if you are diagnosed with HIV positive now, you can and will lead a normal, healthy life because the medications that are out now, they know the side effects, like beyond a reasonable doubt. They know exactly how this is going to affect your body. Now there are tests available, the uh, PCR test that will let you know, and the doctors know that, well, the strain of HIV that you have, we know this, these medications will do nothing. So we're not gonna bother putting you on those medications. So there's a lot more in the pharmacopoeia of dealing with HIV that, like pieces of a puzzle, the doctors know what, this is right for you, for your strain of HIV. Um, and now we know it's not a death sentence. Um, we know how that, that stress is a killer, that lower your stress, eat better, get sleep, common sense things, but even more common sense when you're diagnosed with HIV. Um, so now we know that you can get, um, there's, no, there's no vaccine for HIV, but that's under discussion with at the current Montreal conference. Um, if you can make one for COVID, why can't you for HIV? Um, since they use the tools to develop a COVID vaccine that were used in, in, in uh, disassembling and quantifying all the HIV strains. Um, so you can, you know, get tested. If you think you might have HIV, get tested. Um, it's not a death sentence. And you can lead another, you can lead a, a otherwise happy, normal life um, being HIV positive. Um, not so with COVID. Now there's like long COVID. My sister had COVID, her husband. It's insane. Um, I hope I never do get it because for me, um, having been on um, antiretrovirals for 30 some years, um, I'm in stage three kidney failure. I've had a stroke, I've had a heart attack. And with my kidney failure, those, those three put me at very high risk of complications from COVID. So I'm very aware, like I got, the minute the vaccines were available, I got online for hours trying to find a location because I'm gonna get the vaccine. Uh, same with the booster, I'm gonna get the booster, I'm gonna get the second booster because we know they work. At, at least there's a certain a durability to them. They don't work forever, uh, but they work long enough until you need the second booster. Um, and then you get the second booster. But um, don't be afraid of HIV. Don't be afraid of COVID, but just take the precautions that they say to take. Um, and don't freak out, that's kind of counterproductive.